Stanford University. This is Natalie Marine Street with the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program. Today is August 8th, 2016, and I'm here with Stanford University's Gavin Wright, William Robertson Coe, Professor in American Economic History Emeritus. We're conducting this interview in the Economics Building on campus as a part of the Stanford Faculty Oral History Project. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. And I'd like to begin just by asking you to tell us when and where you were born and something about the place where you grew up. I was actually born in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, but that's almost a novelty because I moved away at a very young age, although years later when I was active in New Haven politics, I did mention from time to time that I was born in that city. But my parents were settlement house workers, and so they moved from place to place uh, several times. They moved from they lived in West Haven, Connecticut, uh, to New York, so I lived uh, for a few years as a young boy in Flushing, uh, but then uh, to Minneapolis. And so I feel my formative years were in the Midwest, in Minneapolis. That's where I went to junior high school and high school. Uh, and even though my parents moved away when I was at college, uh, that's still where I feel my, uh, my spiritual home uh, is located. So I'm familiar with what a settlement house is from the late 19th century, but could you tell me what it meant to be a settlement house worker in the 1940s and 50s? Well, they still used that term. Uh, yeah, I think it dates from the idea of a settlement as a way of facilitating uh, assimilation for the immigrant communities. Um, but uh, it's still applied if you're talking about African Americans moving from the South. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether the clientele were primarily uh, black young people or, or not, but certainly they were well represented. Uh, so it was Philadelphia. Well, actually, they met at a settlement house in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then it was uh, Madison, New Jersey, and then uh, West Haven. Uh, and then finally, uh, Madison House in the uh, Lower East Side of New York. So my father was a summer camp uh, director. So uh, yes, in a way, settlement house, you might say community center, uh, probably the term just stuck long after it strictly applied, but it had a little bit of application because there was massive uh, black migration right. uh, from uh, south to north. Uh, certainly during the war, 40s, but continuing through uh, the 1950s. And did they live at the community center or the well, settlement house? Well, typically they would. Uh, certainly uh, that was true all the way back at Kingsley House in Pittsburgh. But in West Haven, I know they had a house uh, with a street address, and uh, that was certainly true uh, in Flushing. Uh, so uh, we lived in Flushing, which is in Queens, and my father would uh, go off on the subway uh, to work every day. So that was, uh, that was the way it was. Uh, and my mother uh, decided around, she had four kids, and so around that time decided that probably combining work uh, and family life in that way was a little too much, and she uh, w went to school and uh, became a teacher. Okay. My father then got a master's degree, and so he continued to be a social worker for the rest of his life. And so he had a master's degree in social work. Uh, this was after many years of, uh, I think, after he had finished at Madison House, he went up to Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, and got a master's degree. Yeah. Interesting. That was before we went to Minneapolis. And were the houses that they worked with, were they affiliated with the local government, or were they religious organizations? Or? Definitely a private, private sector charity, you might say. Uh, I really don't know the details of the sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I know that when we moved to Minneapolis, he was taking a new kind of position with what was then called the Community Chest and Council, later became a United Fund. 
So that was a consortium of private charities. So he's moving up the ladder uh, to some degree, but still group work and recreation was his field, which meant he was the liaison between this fundraising agency and the uh, various projects of all types and sorts and sizes uh, around the town. Oh, interesting. And did he have a particular commitment to, you know, social justice or those kind of issues, or where did that, his kind of, I'm how did sure he get into that work? He did. Certainly they had a lot of social sympathies, and I recall them talking about at uh, Camp Madison in the summer, you know, making a point they were going to, that was an integrated camp. Uh, back in the 40s, and a time when that was not all that common uh, in the North, no more than in the South. Uh, and uh, they were, th th that place is located in, uh, outside of Peekskill. So Peekskill uh, made the history books because of two concerts given by Paul Robeson, uh, which were broken up uh, by violent mobs protesting, on the one hand, his alleged communist sympathies, but on the other hand, the fact that he was a prominent, outspoken black uh, leader. So my father had to go over to Peekskill and bail some of the counselors out <laughs> after uh, uh, one or more of those concerts. So yeah, uh, social sympathies for sure, uh, they joined the Society of Friends, uh, Quakers. So I was raised in a Quaker family, first in Flushing, uh, Flushing Meeting House, one of the oldest meeting houses uh, in the nation, dates back to 1694 and then uh, in Minneapolis, where we lived in a kind of, it was in Minneapolis, but a suburban type neighborhood. So going over to the university, where the Quaker meeting would meet in a uh, YMCA building, was for me a kind of a liberation, a sense of uh, connection to a much more active, socially conscious, as well as intellectual kind of community than I, uh, than I had back in high school. So this is in Minneapolis then? When right, I, I leapfrogged ahead there, but uh, maybe that's appropriate. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about what it was like to be a teenager and a Quaker. I mean, what kind of, did they have a big active youth component or was it? Well, it's not, it's not going to be very big. Not yeah. going to be very big no matter how you slice it. There are only about 120,000 Quakers uh, in the country. So unless you're a member of one of the big meetings in the Philadelphia area, you're going to be in a small place. But even so, uh, you tend to be uh, nowadays in university areas, and so there was a youth group, and yeah, that was a chance to be connected uh, with them. Uh, I don't want to say that it's a hardship. This is not quite like uh, Garrison Keillor and the Sanctified Brethren, a very strict kind of religious <laughs> order. Uh, but in high school, I was surrounded by Lutherans uh, and uh, very religiously uh, oriented. And so in that sense, I did get a certain sense of not quite fitting in. Uh, sometimes I would get invited to a youth group activity, uh, uh, but that was uh, much. And I would learn that there was a whole uh, youth group church culture that uh, I wasn't part of. Um, other than that, well, I, I you know, I, I did go to Swarthmore, uh, aware that it was a Quaker college, uh, but I knew it was had high intellectual academic standards as well. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for both my wife and I, we were both Swarthmore graduates, uh, we never set foot on campus uh, before arriving when we were arriving as freshmen. And so none of these college tours, uh, in fact, the first time I ever was on an airplane was to fly off to Philadelphia to go to college. Uh, and that was only because I think it was United Airlines offered a kind of back to college discount. If you're willing to fly standby, you could fly for $70, I think it was, uh, one way. And so that's what I did. So uh, I don't want to exaggerate any of these things, I think, compared to what we see for today's students coming from uh, minority communities or uh, poor communities or different language communities. I think the problems of adjustment are much tougher than I faced. But even so, I did feel like a Midwesterner among these very uh, intellectually oriented, uh, much more worldly kind of Eastern, uh, often uh, private school. Uh, students th that were 
uh, well, that, that we're calm and it's worth more. Right. Let's go back just a step. I want to yes. ask you a little bit about your your schooling. Um, what types of schools did you go to, to before you got to Swarthmore? Public school, all the way. I was in a, uh, a session at CEPR, oh, just a couple of years ago, but where the moderator said, how many people in this audience, maybe a couple hundred people, uh, how many people went to public school throughout your entire career? And almost everybody. Not, not 100%, but you know, maybe it was 80%. And then, how many of your children and grandchildren also went to public school? And you know, the hands went down to a fraction. So that's the that's the reality. Although I can say that our <laughs> our two sons both went to uh, public schools, but that was in uh, Palo Alto. So uh, they are kind of elite, uh, high quality public schools. Anyway, I do feel uh, it was a time when virtually everybody went to public schools. And uh, we even lived uh, within walking distance from our elementary school in Minneapolis. So my two younger sisters were able to walk. I, I only had a year and a half. I was in the fifth grade uh, at that school. But then I walked up to the middle school, Ramsey Middle School, and then I walked about a mile to Washburn High School uh, pretty much every day. And it just seemed like, especially in retrospect, but even at the time, the most wholesome, <laughs> middle class uh, kind of upbringing uh, where people were serious about uh, education, uh, high standards, but lots of school spirit. Um, and asking myself later, was that because I, uh, I was having a good time and was oblivious to the fact that others were not? Um, I don't think so. Uh, that's not what I judge from looking at the yearbook materials and talking to people back at uh, reunions. Uh, it was a time, well, uh, of course, the part you can look back and say is, well, we were in uh, a good neighborhood, part of town. Uh, and when you play on the teams and go off to other parts of town, you'd realize, uh, well, not everyone was as well off as we were. But even there, uh, Minneapolis was known for having no slums. Uh, what you define as a slum, it certainly had some differentials. But there was not much in the way of really uh, impoverished neighborhoods uh, or populations in that city uh, at that time. So, okay, I suppose if you, you could say those were the days, I wish we could go back to those days, I sometimes feel that way. Uh, or you might instead say, well, yeah, for guys like us uh, who were in the favored lane, uh, uh, things were very nice in those days, um, but uh, we, we, uh, the question of broadening awareness or consciousness about other people who were not so well off uh, uh, required some doing. Right. And it was a pretty homogenous neighborhood in terms of racial composition that you lived in? Yes. Uh, one of the comments in, uh, from a, another of my high school classmates who went into academics and actually studied uh, racial uh, segregation issues psychological point of view, he said, yeah, we've had so much diversity of the blondes and brunettes uh, <laughs> at Washburn High School. So in that sense, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, really, I was there when the first black students began to attend. Uh, and uh, one was a teammate of mine on the basketball team. Another was a teammate on the track team. And I was so pleased to go back to a 50th reunion and find both of them there with a warm smile and a handshake and a greeting, because as far as I know, they were not all that well treated by even this enlightened, uh, moderate uh, kind of place. Uh, they faced a lot of difficulty being a member of a very small minority, uh, an overwhelmingly white uh, place. So the fact that they were not bitter and were come back and uh, were eager to uh, renew acquaintances uh, was at least moderately encouraging to me. Interesting. But they didn't have busing or anything like that. In, a few in years later they did. Mm -hmm. I missed it uh, by a few years. But yes, uh, even in Minneapolis, uh, and I know this. some of this, we had a grad student a few years after me, uh, Joel Waldfogel, who went on to PhD and had a successful career, but he told me he was bused to another school 
And that's because he bought into the program. It was voluntary. But even so, these things were voluntary. Minneapolis hasn't had the same kind of upheaval elsewhere. But there still was a drift into the suburbs. See, even without a strong racial component, there was a drift into the suburbs. Uh, so Maybe white families moving to the suburbs so that they, their students wouldn't be bused. Uh, I don't know how much was a reaction to, to busing. It was happening even in my time when there wasn't any busing. Uh, well, it was you could get a bigger house uh, and uh, schools that were even better than my school, better in the sense of being better financed. Uh, so that uh, the truth is, although I don't know the details of the later history, Minneapolis did go through the same kind of uh, drift either to the suburbs or to private schools that have happened in other places. Right. And I just wanted to ask a couple more questions about your folks. Um, were they both college educated? Yes. My mother came from a, a Danish immigrant community uh, in New Jersey. And she was the oldest. Her father died when she was in high school at about age 16. So for her to go off to college, uh, she went to New Jersey State College for Women, which is now known as Douglas College, and it's closely affiliated with Rutgers. But for her at that time, even though it was kind of commuting distance uh, by train, uh, it was a big move. Uh, so she did get a college education. And then an even bigger move was when, uh, this is the New Deal era, a lot of social consciousness, she went off to Pittsburgh to work in a settlement house, you know, trying to work with poor people. Uh, and from my grandmother's point of view, uh, this was like uh, moving uh, across the Rockies. <laughs> well, it was across the, yeah, uh, the Alleghenies. Uh, my father was the oldest of three, and uh, his father died when he was five. So his mother was stuck as a mother of three, raising them. Uh, they moved to Richmond, Indiana. So when he grew up, he went to the local college, which is Earlham College, and was always very grateful because Earlham provided a lot of uh, financial assistance and encouragement that otherwise would not have been possible. Uh, so he graduated uh, in 1933. Imagine coming out into the job market at the very bottom of the Great Depression. And I think he went into social work partly for lack of alternatives. I mean, he had a dream of being a commercial artist, uh, still enjoyed painting uh, throughout his life, but there was no way he could uh, make a living doing that. So he just found that there was an opportunity first in Philadelphia and then, you know, something that uh, on the, in the social work settlement house ladder was a uh, a step into a more responsible position uh, out at Pittsburgh, Kingsley House. So, yeah, they both had college education, and I guess they both got master's degrees in the course of time. It was a time of rapid economic growth and rapid social mobility. So, yeah, from a certain perspective, they moved up from somewhere in the lower middle class to maybe somewhere in the upper middle class, but lots of other people were moving uh, that way too in the in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. And did World War II affect them much? I'm sure it did. But uh, again, I don't know the details. Uh, my father was not drafted. He was on the high end of the age distribution, born in uh, 1912. And so uh, that's really all I know. Uh, and then uh, I was a war baby, not a baby boomer, yes. uh, born in 1943, uh, which you might think is a, only a historical labeler would care about that distinction, but it actually <laughs> does make a difference uh, because, uh, well, I do remember going to school with uh, double shifts and a sense of overcrowding. That was in Flushing, uh, not so much in Minneapolis. but. Uh, that's about it. I, I think, the, uh, except for the hardships that everybody went through during the wartime, they were able to carry on with their, their uh, family building, career building uh, activities uh, during the war. Yeah. So were you a pretty good student in uh, elementary school and high school? I was always a good student, and I think probably just because of being well behaved <laughs> or somehow compulsive about getting the lessons done on time, something like that. 
as opposed to being uh, particularly brilliant. Yeah. Was there any indication, looking back, that you would um, turn into a uh, economic historian? Any special interest in history or economics? I was always interested in history. Uh, economics is something I discovered at uh, Swarthmore. So basically, I would say no, not much. Uh, I think when we get to uh, oh well, now we'll be in this in this segment of the interview. I will talk about my experience with the civil rights activity uh, out of, during my college years. So that's when I got interested in the South, and it's certainly what led me to uh, an interest in economic history in the sense of the economic foundations for the social issues that I was trying to trying to work on. But that that's. That's later, and even in my college years, I had no particular conception of economic history as a field of study. Right. Were there any teachers or individuals from that young part of your life that, looking back, you think might have had a significant influence on the course that your life took? I suppose I should have prepared an answer to that, but in all honesty, no. I had many <laughs> favorite teachers in high school. Uh, and coaches, uh, and uh, none of them said, we don't care about grades, uh, we just want to win, or anything <laughs> along that line. Uh, so I feel I absorbed uh, good uh, academic values, but there wasn't any one teacher that was inspirational. Then if I move into college, though, uh, uh, there was uh, one particular economics teacher, that was Joe Conard, uh, who was a Quaker. Uh, and I had already decided to become an economics major, but the way things worked in the Swarthmore Honors Program is you take courses, introductory course, and then maybe a, another follow-up course in your second year, and then your third and fourth years were devoted to these small group seminars. And Joe Conard's economic theory seminar was considered one of the toughest uh, seminars uh, uh, on campus. Well, uh, Joe Condor was inspirational to me because he showed how, through his own life and as well as his way of teaching, he was trying to do uh, the best job he could in terms of teaching the fundamentals of economic theory. But on um, topic after topic, he would devote a little time to say, well, now what do we really make of this? What, how do you feel about this? And he would indicate how he felt in an open discussion. He was really showing how it was possible to maintain a kind of Quaker-based perspective and values, while also being a serious economist. And that being a serious economist means questioning the easy assumptions of idealism, which was one of his phrases, uh, and facing some of the hard realities of life, which a lot of idealistic people often don't want to face. So that was, uh, that was really my first, uh, not exposure to economics, but my first kind of sense that maybe economics could be a, a home for me and my complex right. com <laughs> combination of, uh, of interests. Yeah. So what was um, Swarthmore like? How would you describe it? Well, it has a, this reputation of being uh, high pressured, intellectually very competitive. Even though it's a Quaker school and you get a lot of talk about Quaker values, it's true the, the actual Quaker presence was not all that great, but in the sense of social consciousness and uh, you know any number of outlets for things that would reflect Quaker values, uh, that was there. So after the first semester or so of feeling, and this would be even I had you know one roommate, another guy down the hall, we were good friends. They were far better read than I was, far more sophisticated, and I think that was both a feeling and an authentic uh, reality. So I felt a little intimidated uh, first uh, first year, but nonetheless I found I could do it. Uh, and uh, people who had said, uh, "Okay, you can be one of the smart ones in high school, but when you get to college, everyone's going to be smart. So don't think you're going to be okay." I kind of accepted that <laughs> rationalization for my freshman year, uh, and then I uh, discovered for my second year that in the subject areas that I was most interested in, um, I could actually do uh, even better than that. 
So, uh, in other words, this feeling of intimidation and being slightly uh, behind the crowd kind of uh, drifted away by about my second year. But uh, it was a very liberal activist campus, especially in those days. A few years ago, there was a, I was teaching in the sophomore college program, and they had a panel uh, devoted to uh, our telling about our sophomore years. Uh, and it was very striking, the difference between the early 60s people and the late 60s people, because early 60s people were civil rights, idealists, uh, nonviolence, uh, and uh, late 60s people, there was much more of a sense of chaos and things uh, breaking down. So, okay, I feel I was lucky uh, in that sense. I was involved in quite a few activities uh, at Swarthmore. The, one of them that comes to mind is the, uh, I was co-chairman of the campus Young Citizens for Johnson Humphrey during the election campaign of 1964, where we had a president, of course we've lived through the tragedy of uh, President Kennedy being assassinated. But nonetheless, Johnson, contrary to a lot of expectations, uh, saw the civil rights bill through to completion. Uh, and was talking about extending that legacy to voting rights. Uh, and he had this madman opponent, uh, Goldwater. So I felt uh, that was definitely the thing to do. Now, in terms of the political spectrum, at the Swarthmore, being uh, a mainstream liberal put me somewhat to the right of center, <laughs> whereas there were a lot of <laughs> radical students uh, who were very critical uh, of, of Johnson, and I remember being shocked arriving from Minnesota, where Hubert Humphrey was kind of a godlike figure, hearing some of these uh, left-wing students harshly critical of Humphrey, and that was even before the Vietnam War became such a big issue. So, having led that camp, taken part in that campaign, uh, I certainly felt a sense of betrayal within a few years. And we now know that Johnson was actually planning escalation even while conducting the campaign. So that contrary to the word that was put out, the word that was put out was, well, he has to sound militant because uh, he's got a preempt to Goldwater on this. Really, the reality was exactly the opposite. He was waiting for the election to be over in order to move towards escalating the war. But it took me uh, a while, uh, and this was later when I was at grad school uh, uh, at Yale, uh, to become an activist on that issue <laughs> in opposition to the candidate that I myself had uh, supported. Right. Well, let's stay with those early 1960s. Yes. So, um, had you been a very politically aware person in high school? I felt that I was in the sense that I wanted to be. <laughs> and I had this exposure to a university setting uh, which was uh, more political. But most of my classmates were Republican. Now, they were the moderate Minnesota Republicans uh, of that time. Uh, I think they all would have said they supported civil rights, civil rights being a far off uh, issue uh, somewhere else in the country. Uh, but uh, uh, it was only a kind of a sense of wanting to make a difference uh, in the world. I wouldn't have said that we were highly political as a family or as our discussions. Uh, uh, probably not uh, about average for kind of uh, college educated uh, families at that time. But still I had this idea that when I went to college uh, I would be learning more about the world uh, and I would and that was part of my thinking about economics. Uh, well, maybe this is the time to talk about my summer of 1963. I had uh, worked in construction after my freshman year, trying to save up some money, because I wanted to do something more interesting uh, after the next year. And I was familiar with the American Friends Service Committee, and so I signed up to work on one of their summer projects. Actually, I uh, had no particular orientation towards the South at that time. In fact, the project I signed up for was to go out and work with farm workers in California. That project was canceled. I don't know why, could have been any number of reasons, but as a kind of a consolation prize, 
They assigned me to a voting rights project uh, in a very off the beaten track area in one of the poorest parts of the country, uh, Warren County of North Carolina, the northeastern part of the old uh, tobacco belt. So it was that summer that first exposed me to the South. Uh, I took a 40-hour bus ride from Traverse City, Michigan uh, to uh, Durham, North Carolina, where we had a few days of uh, orientation, and arriving and even kind of looking around at the much more visible black presence uh, that uh, certainly that you had in, in Minneapolis or anywhere else I had been, uh, it had the feel of being the South, being different. And I remember getting on a bus uh, in Durham and looking carefully to observe where were the black people sitting? Were they sitting in the front, sitting in the back? They were sitting everywhere and it didn't seem to be an issue and somehow I uh, hear my uh, amateur uh, effort to observe as a social scientist uh, didn't show me much because there wasn't much visible sign of a conflict. But to make a long story short, that summer uh, was uh, eye-opening to me. Uh, we were working really in a place that had had almost no civil rights activity uh, up to that point. Things were popping, bustling all over the South. We were just trying to encourage people to think about voting rights and going to register to vote. Uh, and the young woman, the young housewife in that town, the wife of a uh, lawyer, uh, had learned about the American Friends Service Committee during her college days in South Carolina, and she wanted exactly a group like us. We weren't going to be threatening. Uh, we weren't going to be um, provocative or spouting revolutionary slogans or anything like that, but we might help to kind of shake things up a little bit and uh, uh, maybe serve as a kind of warm-up act for a much more concerted voting registration project uh, that happened within the next couple of years. None of us saw the Voting Rights Act <laughs> or anything like it. In fact, uh, our thinking at the time was well, we're chipping away at this great edifice uh, of the Jim Crow South, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fast. Uh, it's more like a 50-year project, a kind of a leap of faith. So when I came back three years later as a grad student in economics for a research project based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, it, a revolution had happened. I mean, this change in the atmosphere, in the mood, uh, was so clear, less so in Warrington than in places like Chapel Hill or Durham, for sure, but nonetheless, uh, pretty much uh, everywhere. And then, some 35 years later, 1992, just to scroll forward for a moment, wake up one morning and hear National Public Radio, and they're interviewing a candidate for Congress in North Carolina, and I listen, my wife had called my attention to this. It was Eva Clayton, the very woman who invited our group uh, back in 1963. She was running for Congress. And she was elected. No kidding. First black woman ever from the state of North Carolina, second in, from the South after Barbara Jordan in all of history. So my goodness, this little project that we were part of uh, so many years before actually not that we did it, but the movement did it. It actually produced change, at least in the form of having black representation. But as I later went on to uh, argue in my research, uh, in a much more fundamental economic ways uh, as well. I know I leapfrogged forward there, but I thought I wanted to tell you a sense of why, looking back, that summer was so formative for me. Right. Even though we had, uh, we, I, and nobody that was part of the group, and I don't think the Claytons themselves. I uh, had any idea of how fast uh, things were going to happen over the next few years. So what did you actually do that summer? What were they expecting you to We developed do? a series of programs and went around to the churches, I mean, churches being central to black community life. Uh, and uh, they were, well, I have a slideshow that I show about this, and I show one of our posters, You and Your Vote, a three-part lesson. We would come back, you know, how to register, how to know your candidates, uh, what to do if anything happens, something along that line. And people would turn out and 
take a great interest, and we had a great time. I would play this segregationist candidate, mouthing all the cliches and the slogans, you know, black people are happy. Uh, I think Negroes was the term we would use at that time. You know, I asked my maid, and she assured me that the colored people are happy. And everyone roared uh, at that uh, cliche. So we had a ball, in short. We thought we were doing some good, uh, and we were having a good time doing it, and we had a real sense of welcome and appreciation. Uh, and certainly, we had the experience of being a minority. Uh, Warren County is a black majority county. It was then, and it is now. Uh, but being a minority in the sense of going to what would be virtually in all black uh, churches and social gatherings and mixing in, obviously. We were outsiders, so it wasn't the same as if local people did the same thing. But even so, uh, it was a formative experience. Now the question that we asked ourselves, so that's what we did. Uh, the question we asked ourselves throughout the whole summer and discuss it with local people, how much good are we doing? Not so much how many votes are we going to get, get, but even if everybody could register freely, how much good is this going to accomplish? I mean, what is, what's the vote mean, especially when you would look around the area and it was so obvious that the problems were deeply economic in nature. This was a poor, backward area. Old Tobacco Belt, yeah, we were going to houses of sharecroppers, people, very poor tenant farmers. To, I've uh, had a soft spot for tobacco farming ever since that summer uh, because uh, here we were uh, in the middle of the tobacco belt. None of us smoked. Uh, <laughs> and we, we even took a field trip at one time to a uh, tobacco uh, cigarette factory. You know, people were asking tough, challenging questions about, you know, how do you square this with your conscience and that kind of thing. But it was clear, there was not much, and tobacco farming is one of the last bastions of small family farming and for, uh, for black farmers, among others. But clearly was not much future there. And uh, young people who got uh, any opportunity to leave, uh, some education, or just hearing about a job opportunity somewhere, uh, they were leaving. It was a declining area. And the question is, what does this have to do with the vote anyway? Uh, and even with the idea of non-anti-discrimination legislation or something like that. In other words, I was pondering what's the relationship between the race issue and the, and the economic issue. And it was clear at the end of the summer, uh, I didn't understand it. I felt I needed more advanced training in economics. And uh, of course, later when I got my advanced training in economics, I found it still had not answered uh, the questions I was wrestling with. And so basically, I've devoted much of my career to trying to figure that out. Uh, that's uh, the culmination of that is the book I published in 2013 called Sharing the Prize, which is about the economics of the civil rights revolution in the, in the South. But that was many, many years ahead. Uh, and uh, were, were a lot of different, uh, a lot of perspective in addition to uh, economics training uh, was at work there. Right. So let me just ask you one more question about Warrington. Um, yep. Did anybody resist what you were trying to do there? Yes, indeed. Uh, now, people often ask, you know, how could your parents have let you do that? Uh, weren't you frightened? Uh, I don't know. It's almost involuntary. We were not frightened. I at least were not frightened. It was despite the fact that there were some overt uh, actions against us. In fact, I mentioned, I started to say, uh, show a slide, you and your vote, uh, a kind of agenda, and then I show the next slide is that same sign, shot through with buckshot. Mm. In other words, somebody saw fit to <laughs> make this threatening move. We would have instances where a uh, group of us, you know, we would, typically we would be walking, even though long distance from house to house, we would be walking out on a country road and a car would swerve in our direction. Uh, you know, how seriously they were after us, uh, I don't know. Uh, despite all that, I think compared to the stories coming out of Mississippi and other places, I think we were not in an area known for the high level of uh, violence in the response to civil rights activity. 
Now, the following summer, there was a, a second group from the American French Service Committee, and the registration campaign had revved up uh, to a much higher pitch, uh, and, the, uh, and the resistance, the overt acts, were uh, more severe. There was some kind of projectile that was actually fired into the apartment. We lived in a little apartment above a black-owned grocery store. Uh, and uh, that was that must have been pretty pretty sobering. I wasn't there in the summer right. of '64, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, there was resistance. And yet, even talking about the following summer, for whatever reason, uh, it was not the same as the kind of stories that you hear about uh, Mississippi summer. So sure, maybe we had reason to be reason to be fearful, and somehow the. Uh, the, fear, the fearlessness of youth uh, led us to uh, downplay that. Right. But basically, no, we certainly were not welcomed with open arms. And what we later learned was certainly by far the most revolutionary thing that we were doing was living as a racially integrated group in this, uh, the 16 of us, in this little uh, uh, apartment above a black owned grocery store. I say racially integrated and sexually integrated, and as far as the white townspeople were concerned, their imaginations ran wild as to what they imagined might have been going on uh, in that apartment house, because we were certainly defying social norms uh, by, uh, by, by just living that way. Um, and you were all college students? Uh, we were all, yes, uh, we were all college students, that's right. Uh, my memory has been refreshed on this, I should mention, because we had a 50th anniversary uh, in Warrington, uh, the fifth uh, reunion, where we were actually able to contact uh, every living member. Not everyone has survived, but uh, and all but one came to that reunion, including one guy from Africa, no kidding. Zimbabwe, two from uh, British Isles. <laughs> Uh, I learned from that uh, trying to tr effort of tracking down people, a couple of my comrades, uh, one has been living, working as a psychiatrist in San Francisco all these years, another is a, a flower farmer uh, down to the south of us, uh, so uh, that was quite remarkable. Uh, I was somewhat trepidatious about what kind of welcome we would get because after all, we were outsiders. Uh, coming back and maybe appearing to claim credit uh, for something where we had not really done all that much one summer, I should not have worried. Uh, not many people remembered 50 years back about the only people who did were Eva Clayton herself uh, and her family, who after a distinguished 10-year career uh, in Congress, she's still going strong. Uh, and uh, they were delighted to, to welcome us back and relive the old days with us. And the, we held our reunion meeting in the public library of Warrington, where black people were not allowed to make use of back in 1963. Mm -hmm. And we got feature coverage in the local newspaper, which was certainly not <laughs> giving us that kind of favorable attention uh, 50 years before. Uh, but we, we pooled our photo collection and uh, our memories, and uh, it's, uh, it, it brought much of it back, uh, even though you can never really recover. I'll tell you one sign of change. Uh, there were two antique shops run by two gay guys uh, thriving. I wouldn't say the downtown area is thriving, but they're doing pretty well. And yeah, even under black political leadership, they have the good sense to maintain their tourist attraction as an old uh, antebellum town with lots of uh, beautiful old uh, buildings there. Uh, well, um, I don't know. I lost my thread there. So yeah. So very interesting, and it was a formative time for you, you said. So you, you got back then, this is the summer of 1963, you get back and... Yeah, well, um, I, I continued my uh, economics education. Uh, you know, I don't want to say I had a single-minded focus, uh, and, I, and I certainly did not have a clear idea that uh, economic history was going to be my specialty. 
But I did have that interest, that developed interest, and I was looking for a chance to uh, build on it. Right. The uh, following summer, 1964, uh, one of the things that we heard a lot of back in 63 was, uh, what are you com doing coming down here trying to help us with our problems? Don't you have problems closer to home? And that was uh, indeed uh, close to home because uh, it was very true. Uh, that there were racial issues uh, virtually everywhere throughout the North, and a progressive, ultra-liberal school like Swarthmore College was almost as segregated as any place else. The few black faces that you might see around campus, uh, well, of course, all the maids were black, but uh, among the students, they're probably African. So even during the time that I was there, and it accelerated in the late 60s after we were there, they were beginning to bring uh, black students in. But we, and here I mean my, my wife and myself, we were, actually we met, summer of 1964, on a project that was Swarthmore Wade House Summer Studies Program. The idea was to bring promising junior high school age kids from around the area and acquaint them with life on a college campus and maybe uh, open up their consciousness to the idea that they might go to college. Maybe some of them could even go to Swarthmore College, a place like that, uh, as forbidding as it might have seemed. Uh, and this was a forerunner to the program that later became federally funded as the Upward Bound uh, program. So that was another <laughs> change of pace, uh, another kind of way of spending a, devoting a summer to uh, socially conscious uh, activity. Did we accomplish anything much? Well, I think we did. Uh, actually, uh, I think at least two of those uh, campers that we had were, uh, did become Swarthmore College students uh, just a few years down the road. And uh, sorry to say, nobody has done a follow-up tracking of all the <laughs> participants and what happened to them, but I would guess, given the things that were happening on various campuses, that a, a fair number of them did uh, end up attending college. Right, so how did it work? So the students came and they came and stayed over in the dorms, or how did the program No, work? it was a day camp. Yeah. So I was one of the drivers. Uh, we would go around and pick up the, I'll call them campers. I don't know if we did call them campers, but. Uh, now, one thing that had to be true, we were committed to the idea, it had to be a racially integrated program. We weren't gonna run an all black program. So that meant you had to go to different neighborhoods around the Swarthmore area. Uh, so one of them was Brookhaven, which was essentially an all white community. Uh, down at Chester to the south, that was essentially an all black group. And then there was a little town called Media, uh, where we actually had a racially integrated group. But anyway, it was the, only, the only way we could get a racially integrated group uh, on campus at the same time was to do this driving routine, which I love doing, because uh, you got out in the countryside, you got a sense of uh, being part of the area that you didn't get from just sitting there uh, on campus. Uh, and by and large, uh, it was successful in the sense that, you know, you get kids of the same age together and the fact that you have blacks and whites and that they have very different backgrounds, uh, they have a lot of group activities. We didn't have a common enemy particularly, but we, our message about the possibility, the, the joys of learning uh, and the possibilities of college education, they were for everybody. And then did they hear lectures when they came, or did they yeah. have lessons, or? Yeah, they would divide up into groups. I you know, taught a kind of one-week one tutorial in economics, uh, trying to figure out you know, some way into the subject matter that would be, uh, be uh, eye-opening to them. You know, I, I'm not trying to say this was a, I was a huge success, uh, but you'd, uh, you'd get them to pay attention, respond to questions, participate in discussion, and then yes, we would have uh, speakers, uh, faculty members. One memorable faculty member was my political science teacher at that time, Fred Hargadon. Oh. I'm saying this to the, to the Stanford uh, listeners because years later Fred became a legendary uh, dean of admissions here, Dean Fred. He was my political science uh, teacher. No kidding. 
Uh, and in fact, you know, people of my era, the one question you can always ask is, where were you when you heard about Kennedy's assassination November 22nd? Well, I can tell you exactly where I was, but also the fact that I was taking Fred Hargadon's comparative government uh, seminar uh, at that time, because of course, whatever else we were supposed to be studying, that was the dominant topic of conversation. Fred came and spoke to those uh, junior high school age kids, and he kind of put on a, a spoof, you might say, uh, talking about how they had uh, discovered that there were these uh, clubs that were trying to influence young people in America, it's called the Nasarima Clubs. It's American spelled backward, but. Yeah. <laughs> And he actually had those kids buying into it that, you know, that they should be looking at for suspicious activity among their classmates and maybe even among their parents. And, you know, it was like, in a small way, the famous Stanford prison experiment where you can, uh, uh, under the right inducement, you can get impressionable young people to buy into all manner of... Uh, uh, far out conspiratorial doctrine. Now, in that case, I, I think it was a good learning experience because by the end of the session, we came clean and said, no, there aren't any such clubs and he's just putting you on and, you know, don't believe everything you hear even on a college campus. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's a vivid memory oh, of uh, Fred Harganon and how well he uh, performed his act. Interesting. So, you, you said you did remember really vividly where you were uh, during the Kennedy assassination, so oh, tell me. Oh, I don't have any particular story in the sense that I was, I was walking across campus and I heard somebody shout out, you know, Kennedy was shot in the head. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not have televisions in our dorm rooms. So if you wanted to follow something on television, you'd go to one of the common areas. I went to the snack bar and uh, we kind of watched uh, the unfolding events for the next few days. So in a way, when you say, where were you when you heard, that's when I first heard. But it was another couple of days before it was confirmed that he really was, uh, there was a kind of false report a day later that maybe he had a chance to recover. Um, and But that was the beginning of a kind of nightmare whirlwind years for our country because, you know, that was another shooting <laughs> in Dallas. And uh, the issue's been debated ever since about just what was going on, Lee Harvey Oswald, and uh, why was he shot by Jack Ruby, and so on. So yeah, here I am saying that the early 60s people were the ones where things were reasonably calm and nonviolent. Uh, not entirely. Uh, that was certainly the big, uh, the big exception. Right. So when did you start to get involved with the Johnson campaign then? And how did that come about? I really can't remember the details, but I'm sure somebody invited me <laughs> to take on this role. And I was inclined to say yes. Uh, it was uh, the, the local area Democratic Party. And I've, by that time, I had been, uh, so uh, summer before, uh, I can't, really can't quite remember the connections, but. I, I was a senior, my name was known. If they were looking for somebody who had shown they could handle responsibility and would be sympathetic, somebody asked me. Uh, and uh, so I agreed to do it. Uh, and I, uh, one possibility for someone who asked me was a guy just one year behind me named Peter Purcell. Uh, and Peter at that time was looking for a possible career in the Democratic Party. Uh, so he may have uh, reached out to me. Uh, now, uh, you may not recognize the name Peter Purcell, but he actually went on, we both went to Yale, got PhDs in economics, and Peter became a New York Times economics column. He's the one that created that economic scene column that they have. He did that for years and years. Uh, finally uh, retired out to, or left that behind, uh, has been at the Milken Institute uh, recent times. And then another young guy, uh, younger by one year than me, uh, Jack Nagel, also interested in political science. Uh, he also worked closely with me, and I think of him because he also came along to Yale uh, and was the one who got me involved in uh, New Haven local politics uh, at that time. So uh, I remember the connections, 
and I was just looking at my folder and looking at heaps of uh, records of, I don't know if this kind of thing happens. Uh, they would send buses to the campus uh, and the students would get on and be bussed out to a neighborhood where they would go knock on doors with campaign literature, talking about the campaign. One of the issues was, of course, the local Democratic Party wanted them to be pushing the entire Democratic slate, whereas a lot of the students would say, well, no, I don't know anything about these local candidates. I only want to support uh, <laughs> uh, Johnson Humphrey. But nonetheless, uh, a lot of activity was conducted, and I've got a stack of thank you notes and appreciations afterwards because it was considered uh, uh, a great success. So it was the kind of thing uh, that I would be inclined to do. Uh, and I remember uh, one of our slogans, one of the slogans of the campaign was all the way with LBJ. Whereas some of the more radical students, they agreed that Goldwater should not be president. <laughs> but their slogan was part of the way with LBJ. Yeah. And they would have a series of objections uh, to various things that he was doing. One of which, of course, was uh, uh, the Vietnam. The, the, the threat of escalation in Vietnam. So they were more perceptive, or at least more prescient uh, than I was at the time, because I sure didn't see that coming. Uh, and I thought that, no, he would find a way to make peace. Right. And so you helped organize the students to get on these buses then? Yeah, it wasn't hard. Uh, you know, we didn't have email, right. <laughs> but everyone had uh, mailboxes. Uh, so it was very easy to just put notices or announcements in the, in the campus paper. Uh, and a lot of people were eager to do something uh, to help on that campaign. Yeah. Did you use a mimeograph machine? I'm sure we did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the famous um, political activism tool of that of that era. I've got one right over here. Oh. Uh, this is from the New Haven days, but uh, oh, interesting. I will, uh, now, so I, where are we in the narrative? Yeah. Then? Well, I just I was snooping around in your college newspaper and saw a notice about you getting to meet LBJ. Did that ever happen? It did. It did happen. Well, the college was celebrating its 100th anniversary, 1964. And the speaker who was scheduled and had accepted was President Kennedy. So that was <laughs> pretty shocking. But nonetheless, Johnson <laughs> accepted the invitation, uh, and he came. And I was not present. My wife is class of 1964, so she was there. She talked about having secret service security all over the tops of the buildings and so on. And they would uh, warn you. Now you're saying, people, everyone's wearing a gown for graduation. It would be the easiest thing in the world to hide a higher power rifle under a gown. Well, that makes you suspicious of everybody when you hear that. But nonetheless, <laughs> they kept the peace. He gave, uh, it was said to be a relatively, uh, uh, mediocre kind of talk about the, the, joy, the joys and importance of working for the federal government. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there was that connection. But I think really it was my uh, role as uh, local chairman of the Young Citizen for Johnson Humphrey that got me my invitation to the, to the White House. It was nothing much to speak of. Uh, we went through a long assembly line, and when they announced me as from Swarthmore College, he said, I enjoyed being there. And so I was like, oh, we were, it was a pleasure to have you, Mr. President. And then it was on to the next. So not much of a memorable uh, meeting, but at least he remembered uh, <laughs> that he'd given a talk at Swarthmore. That's right. So before we leave Swarthmore, um, tell me how you met Kathy again. Uh, Katha, uh, Katha is the way she pronounced Sorry. her name. Uh, that's a common bond we've had all these years. Uh, C-A-T-H-A, -H -H Katha, and uh, I'm G-A-V-I-N, Gavin, so we sometimes even write a bar on the name ah. tag. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we were both on the staff of this Swarthmore Wade House uh, Summer Studies Program in 1964. So it was the second summer in a row where we had a co-ed, <laughs> racially integrated group uh, living in a dormitory. This was a little more spacious than the one back in, uh, in Warrington. So she was interested in drama, and she taught a class in drama, and she actually directed a little, uh, couple of little performances uh, during that summer. I was doing economics, and we were part of the, part of the team. So that's how we met. Uh, we didn't really click until later, but uh, she stayed in the area, uh, actually working for Wade House, 
which was, I would call it a settlement house uh, in Chester, maybe community center is the word. But they were actually one of the co-sponsors of that summer studies program. Uh, and so uh, basically that's how we met. Let me tell you about those two theatrical productions. Uh, we were going off to see a performance of West Side Story. So being uh, in a venue of uh, higher education, we felt, or at least Katha felt, uh, they ought to, if you're gonna see West Side Story, you gotta know Romeo and Juliet. Uh, so the staff, the faculty, put on a little abbreviated version. I can still recite the Queen Mab speech. Uh, uh, so this was to let them know, okay, when you see West Side Story, you can see where the, where the story comes from. Another thing she did where the kids were doing it was an abbreviated version of Our Town. Good old American, uh, sentimental, hometown drama. Except this was going to be a racially integrated cast. And as it happened, I don't think she intended this, but the young couple, uh, uh, was uh, a black guy and a white girl. Of course, if it had just been left to us, no, nothing would have come of it. But this fact that we were promoting race mixing at Swarthmore College uh, made the uh, gun out and uh, it became a hot item on uh, some of the right wing talk radio, which was going on uh, even at that time. So uh, yes, uh, <laughs> dramatic performances can uh, kind of make the news. Uh, we had another incident where, you know, a very favorable write up of the program appeared in the Philadelphia newspaper. But the headline on the story says, Swarthmore students work with the culturally, culturally deprived mm. young people. Mm. Uh, among some of the white parents, they were extremely unhappy to have their, <laughs> their kids labeled as culturally deprived. And you know, once it's there in the headline, there is not much we could do, but other than to tell them all it was a mistake, uh, it was not directed to uh, anybody, and uh, I don't think we actually had any dropouts. We were able to persuade them that the, the benefits to the kids of having this culturally enriched program over the summer outweighed their, their hurt feelings, but right. that tells you something about the temper of the times. Yes, really interesting. All right, well, let's take a quick break, and then we'll head okay. off to Yale. Very good.